from crease to crease and corner to corner. Better Hockey Now is NHL fantasy and betting done better. Step into the dot for Better Hockey Now on the Better Sports Network. Welcome in to another edition of Better Hockey Now on the Better Sports Network and Fantasy Alarm. I'm Adam Bernard, and with me, as always, are my line mates. Uh, to my right, if you're watching, Mr. Christopher Merez at Fuzzy Chris91 on Twitter. To below right me is Anthony Rivera at Ant Rivera86 on Twitter. I'm at Pucking Thoughts on Twitter. Always good to be here, and fellas. This is uh, the last episode of Better Hockey Now before the puck drops on the season. So we, we made it. We're there. We did it. Can you say that again? It you is the see. last episode before the uh, season puck, uh, before we drop the puck on the season for 2023 24. Did someone wake up Green Day now that it's October? Like now that it's October? I just, like, I, I was worried. I mean, yeah, I hope so. It's October second, so I mean, they've already missed a day. If nobody, if no, if Billy Joe is not up yet, then uh, he's already missed a day. It's the best time of year, honestly. Lots Music to our ears. Good, good weather. Lots of good sports. Uh, yeah, you know, Halloween. You know, lots of people love Halloween. You're right. It, it, this is a good time of the year. Thanksgiving. Who doesn't love to uh, stuff their face? Both American and Canadian Thanksgivings. Got both of them in the fall. It's great. Uh, but the, last week we uh, talked about. Uh, division and team futures, uh, you know, where we think they're going to finish in the standings, you know, division champs, Stanley Cup champs, that stuff. Today, we're going to go through awards futures. We'll also talk a little point totals and uh, give out a proper two each uh, for the upcoming season, a player prop. Uh, before we dive into that, though, uh, exciting news that uh, we're going to be uh, hosting the FSGA uh, annual hockey draft. Uh, they have uh, two leagues, a Champions League and an American League, and we'll be covering both of them for you here on the Better Sports Network and Fantasy Alarm on Monday, October 9th. Uh, the three of us will be uh, bringing that to you, so we're very excited to that. There'll be a participant uh, in each league from this show as well, so it'll be fun to react uh, live on the air to a draft that's going to mean something throughout the season. So good stuff there. But we got to talk betting today. We've done plenty of fantasy on uh, Better Hockey Now. We're going to, like I said, the last two episodes before the season, we're going to do some betting talk. Um, Let's see here. First uh, award we're going to do. Well, let's the, the new guys. You want, you want to start with the new guys first, the uh, Calder candidates? Let's yeah. Do Seems, sounds fair. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, this is an award that, you know, most people are going to be like, okay, fine. You know, this is Connor Bedard's to lock up. You know, I mean, he, he's already hyped. He's the next McDavid. We all heard all the, you know, adjectives to describe how great this guy is going to be. But there are other candidates. You know, what if Bedard gets hurt? What if he has a really bad start out of the gate and other guys have a strong start and he can't recover from that. Uh, so Chris, a guy we had talked about last time, uh, Devin Levi would probably be, even though he's not here at plus 1200, the second best favorite, he was a guy that we had discussed would be probably our second best favorite. That's, uh, that's who I'm going with. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about Devin Levi. If you haven't already, uh secret seems to be out of the bag for him a little bit now i remember there was a time where you you can almost get him undrafted uh if you did your draft in like early june that no longer exists um but it, it is it's I, here's the thing i feel like if he is just he doesn't even have to be elite he has to be just very very good if he is very good and let's say he backstops let's say the hypothetical situation he backstops uh, the Buffalo Sabres to a division title, right? Like you can't not give it to him considering the position that he plays and his age. Like it's exceptionally hard to be a young player in the NHL. It's even harder to be a young goalie in the NHL and have success, right? Like there have lots, there have been lots of great goalies to come into the NHL and, you know, struggle to win and these we're talking about future hall of famers right i remember mark andre Fleury came in the league not it didn't go well pittsburgh was a bad team granted uh old enough to remember when Kerry price came into the league didn't didn't go well so it is it is really hard for goalies to come in and have success i think this is different for levi i think he got a couple of games in under his belt he understands a little bit what the nhl is he's going into this on a arguably pretty good team they're not terrible so a lot of good things can happen here. It's still Carter Bedard's trophy to lose. But if I expect him to be as good 
as he can be, then he has a legitimate chance of being able to win this with the exception of, again, if Bedard scores 40 and 100 points, then just give him the thing and we can all move on. But uh, I have a little bit of sprinkle on Devin Levi. I have I've invested in him in many different ways. Let me throw out a little question for you. Who was the last goalie to win the Calder Trophy? Last goalie? The last goalie to take the Calder Trophy. The hint I will give it is 2009 was the last time the goalie has won the award. And that's why I make an argument for him. Is it uh, Braden Holpe? Right at division. It's Steve Mason. Wow. So... I didn't yes, have that on the people, roster. Some people would point to that. And then the previous goaltender before that was Andrew Raycroft in 2004. And then before that was Yevgeny Nabokov in 2001. Now, he went on to go be a, a hell of a goaltender. But, and then it was Marty Brodeur before him in 94. Point being is goalies don't get it often. So you might be like, why would that? That would be an argument against it. No, they're just usually goalies don't present themselves in a rookie season to a level where they can be considered. Voters love to vote for goal. Uh, would love to vote for a goalie for a rookie of the year cha- for a change of pace. So if Levi does even a nice percentage of everything, ta- winning a division, just getting to the playoffs and looks strong, and you know Buffalo keeps winning, again, it's still Bedard's to lose. But Levi might be you know neck and neck on him. And and you agree too on Levi. I saw uh, we talked per- earlier before the show. Yeah, Chris has done his best to campaign for Devin Levi this whole time we've been on Better Hockey Now, and he has succeeded. I am uh, drinking the Kool-Aid uh, for Devin Levi, and I, t- I say if if they make the playoffs, because the Sabres, I think, were one point out of making the playoffs, and they really didn't have any great goalie in front of the net a- at all. So if, if Levi can come in and lead them to a, a – playoff appearance I, I think that's pretty good and outside of bedard uh getting the 40 goals you know getting 100 points uh, i think that levi has a really good chance of uh you know taking that call to trophy now a couple other names on that list you know that are recognizable luke hughes at plus 700 for me if i had to pick somebody that's not levi or bedard fantilli's got kind of a you know as much as a household name you're going to have as a rookie in the nhl He's going to be playing on that top line in Columbus with Johnny Gaudreau. Uh, so, again, you know, he's going to have every opportunity. He's going to be up there and amongst the leaders in rookie scoring. So, again, if Bedard takes a step back and, you know, Levi, you know, has a little bit of a, you know, we'll say a slump, you know, the door could be open for Fantilli. Now, there was another guy you were looking at, I believe, as well, Ant. Yeah, I was looking at Matthew Nice from uh, Toronto. He's going to be on a line with uh, John Tavares. Uh, a lot of talk about him uh, possibly being there. I, I think it's good for, you know, the plus 2,500. Uh, I think that's, you know, good to sprinkle a little money that way for him, um, especially with the other names that are on here. Um, I would love to to think Logan Cooley would be one of those guys, but you're, we're talking about Arizona. Um, I don't know what line he's going to be on because if he's not on the top line there, uh, I think it's going to be very tough for him to really, you know, generate with that group right now. They're, they're, they're up and coming. They're not there yet. But uh, what we've seen from Logan Cooley in the preseason uh, should should uh, get some uh, people sprinkling some money on him. And Brent Clark's going to have some hype on him too, but not enough to win a Rookie of the Year trophy. But uh, nonetheless, he'll definitely, if he, you know, has the impact that everybody's expecting this year on the Kings blue line and uh, contributing on the power play. He'll get a little buzz there, too. So, uh, yeah, there's a Calder Trophy odds. And uh, we're going to move on to the Patrice Bergeron Award, a.k.a. the Selkie Trophy. Before it was the Patrice Bergeron Award, it was the Pavel Datsuk Award. So, you know, you just keep going back. This award tends to be, um, you know, dominated by one guy. But that guy's not here anymore. So you might think it's a wide open field. I personally think it's a two person field. I know Nico, he shares the favorite at minus 350. I'm going to go with Andre Kopitar, and here's why. And this is going to be more of a sentimental pick. Um, he's 36 years old, should have won more if it wasn't for Patrice Bergeron. Barkov is the other guy that you can throw in as like a guy that's gotten screwed a bunch because of Bergeron. He's a little bit younger. He'll get his, I think. 
I think they give Kopitar one more. He's already got one on his shelf uh, before Barkov takes over next year. So I'm going to say Kopitar at uh, plus 1,200 uh, is the sentimental favorite to get the Selkie this year. That's fair. I've gone with Barkov. I mean, for all the reasons, I would probably give it to Bergeron. Uh, again, if he was still playing, but how kind of him to allow others to win it. That was the only way you were going to beat him was in retirement. Uh, you know, Barkov's a good two-way pretty good two way forward. And it's this award now can be given to guys who can rack up uh, 85, 90 points, right? You're not looking at your traditional, you know, third line center kind of guy who's going to just play well defensively, right? Like you could give it to Sean Kateri or Philip Deneau for, you know, the roles that they play, Yanni Gord, Ryan O'Reilly, but those like, it's not, those guys have a hard time winning now because they don't rack up the points as well. Um, Barkoff to me is yes. Kachuk is there. Uh, and all that, but he is still, he, he brings that stability on both ends of the ice. I, I totally agree with you, Anna, that, you know, Ozzy Kopitar could easily win it, uh, because he, he is still good and they're still asking him to do a lot of things. I think the only thing that holds him back here is, you know, he's not going to be asked to do as much of that now that Philip Deneau and Pierre-Luc Dubois are in town. Um, you know, looking around the board as well, I don't know. I mean, Mitch Marner, cool, maybe, uh, but. You know, Joel Erickson act the same thing. I don't think of Elias Pedersen as really a Selkie Award winner. Not yet, right? I think he can become one. Um, but I don't yeah, have him there. High. Yeah, he's up there. He's he's kind of found himself at the top of some draft boards, at the top of some awards. But uh to me, it's it's bark off just for the offense that he brings, the the game that he plays. I mean, he doesn't even take penalties. So he is the definition of the Selkie award and I will gladly sprinkle a little bit for him at 1200 and sleep well at night. So, Ant, I believe is going to be taking the favorite here. Uh, no surprise uh, with the devil shirt on. He's not a Homer, but I mean, listen, there's a reason why he shares a minus three fifty for this award. Yeah. I got to take the captain of the devils here. Uh, every year he has improved. Although, I mean, health has been taking a toll on him in the beginning of his career, but last year, 31 goals, 49 assists, 80 points. I mean, he was a plus 33 from being a minus one in, in one season. And you, you know, you got to look at who he's surrounded by. Timo Meyer is going to be on his line. And I don't, it, it, Daily Faceoff has Alexander Holtz, but I'm pretty sure Dawson Mercer is going to be and uh, right beside him. And you put Meyer and Mercer, those two guys, and you sandwich Nico Heischer in between there. He plays defense. Uh, I think this is might be the time to uh, bet a little bit on Nico Heischer there. He's a quiet player, but uh, he is the captain of the Devils, and he leads by example. And I, I think this is a great opportunity for him, you know, to take this award. And other guys that I mean, listen, Joel, just by the sh sheer definition of the trophy, Joel Erickson Eck would probably be should be a guy you consider more, but he's not in a flashy market. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't have the you know, the name factor outside of, you know, being a wild fan. But yeah, he is a guy that absolutely embodies that. A little bit of a longer shot that, you know, maybe would be worth throwing some money on too is Rupe Hintz at plus 3,000. Mm -hmm. Maybe an important part of that. I mean, he probably doesn't get there, but, you know, as an outside, you know, dark horse candidate, certainly not, you know, not something, you know, for plus 3,000, it's worth, you know, a couple bucks to throw on it, see what happens. Uh, so yeah, there is the Selkie trophy. Now we're going to move on to the uh, Norris Trophy here, and I, I you know, we we've got three different answers here. Uh, you know, and listen, Kel McCarr plus one ninety. I mean, everyone's going to be like, oh, well, he's probably got it locked up. I mean, probably, but you don't know. Listen, I, I think you know, you, there's a lot of ways you could go with this. For me, it's Rasmus Dahlin. His point total has increased each of his first uh, full of his three uh, full seasons. The first three full seasons he played. Sabres became an offensive juggernaut last year, so his point total is probably going to go up again well, now that they found their groove. So I think he goes up again. And, you know, Makar and Fox already have awards. He's the new kid on the block. He's a former first overall pick. I think this year could really be his coming out party. And I think he's going to be in a fun offense. He, you know, the Sabres, if they do what everybody thinks they're going to do, they're going to be the darlings of the league. They're going to be the young, fun bunch. And I think Dal Darlene's a big part of that. Plus eight hundred. That's where I'm placing my money for the Calder. Uh, excuse me for the uh, Norris Trophy. Yeah, that's uh, that's fair. Uh, I'm gonna go a little bit further down. I'm gonna go to Miro uh, Haskinen. 
I think he gets overlooked quite a bit uh, because he plays in Dallas, uh, you know, and everything else. Miro Heiskanen is on kind of a little bit of of an island on his on his own, meaning that he is he is by far the best defenseman on his team. I'm not taking anything away from you know the rest of the you know Dallas's defense core, but I mean Ryan Suter is not the guy that he he was was. Essa Lindell doesn't have the you know the offensive numbers. Yes, Jake Ottinger is a good goalie, but you know M- M- Miro Heiskanen, if I'm not mistaken, cracked 60 assists, and he plays in all situations. He's going to play more on the power play. He he has an opportunity here to really kind of set the example for what a Norris Trophy winner should be. So a defenseman who can rack up points but also play well in his zone. A lot of people were criticizing Eric Carlson because of his you know his defensive liabilities, but he also put up a hundred points. So we'll give him you know the benefit of doubt. He also played in San Jose, where you know they were looking at his plus minus, which again as we've talked about, is not an effective way to measure any player's defensive value, neither real or in fantasy. So you should get rid of that stat completely. Uh, to me, I just feel like Kill like Kill McCarr has Devontae's, you know, Adam Fox has a, you know, Kandre Miller, Jacob Truba, the whole, you know, the whole nine yards there. I'll throw in Owen Powers for Rasmus Dahlin, right? I mean, Quinn Hughes is kind of coming up. There's so many things that he doesn't do either, right? That I think he can grow into at some point. I just think Miro Haskinen, from a complete defenseman standpoint, I think he is the best. So that's where I'm going to lay it out. He can go out and and he he may not get the most points, but I do think that he can exemplify exactly what that position is. Kale McCarr can still easily win it because he is flashy. And yes, he can play in a, you know, in a bunch of situations and, can rack up a ton of points and he's a fluid skater. Uh, but I like the value on Mara Heiskin. And, and I just don't, I, I think if he played in a different market that was in Dallas, you would probably hear a little bit more about him. I don't disagree with that. And the, here's the thing with Heiskin in two is, as you alluded to, like I don't, as in terms of being an all around defenseman, that's not just the offensive source, but also can handle his defensive end. He's probably the best on that list, at least in the top portion. Um, and if Dallas goes, you know, we talked about on the last episode where a lot, a few of us were bullish on Dallas to potentially win the Central and the West. Maybe he's going to be a big part of that. And if they if they're there, and I know the voting happens after the regular season, but if they're in that kind of position where they're a favorite or they're a team that people are looking at to maybe make a run, you know, that that, that certainly helps in terms of the voting as long as he has that kind of campaign. Now, and you are also uh, not in that. Uh, top three that we were talking about you've got a pick there that uh, i like as well first off i love both of your picks um i think they're great picks and i I do really think they have a a huge chance to to win the trophy Uh, i'm going with quinn hughes with the value uh plus 1400 Uh, now the newly crowned captain of the vancouver canucks he holds that top line he's improved every year and I wish he would uh, there be an uptick in the goals for him. Uh, that that's somewhere that he uh, lacks, but he's always there for assists. The points are always high for him. Um, at plus fourteen hundred, I, I don't think that's a bad shot with with Quinn Hughes. I think he takes another leap and in, in being one of the the best defensemen in the league. And here's the other thing too. You know, Carlson won it last year on an extremely bad Sharks team. Now I'm not saying the Canucks are going to be as bad as the Sharks were last year. But the Sharks were able to say, okay, Eric, just go out there and do your thing and just run your numbers up because we don't really, we're not, you know, we're not going to really win a lot of games anyway, so go get it. Not to the same extent, but Vancouver can find them find themselves in that situation and really just let him run, especially down the stretch if he's got a chance and maybe he can, you know, take the push over and take the top if there's an injury up there or he just has that outstanding of a season. It is... It is entirely possible. I think the things that just hold him back are the, you know, the the outlining. Like, yes, he he can rack up assists, right? He finished with sixty nine of them last year, but you know, he he doesn't. To me, he just he he doesn't shoot the puck, right? I don't see him being a guy who doesn't throw his weight around, doesn't really block a ton of shots either. He is a very not a one trick pony, but you you know what you're getting out of him. And he can eat like his his vision is great. Like he can quarterback the top power play unit and it can be very successful. I want to see just a little bit more from him to be able to really say, okay, this this player exemplifies every part of what I'm looking for. 
And that's why I think like Miro, for me, that's how I went with Miro Hiskin. And look, maybe Quinn Hughes takes this personally, right? Maybe he listens maybe. and he says, I'll show you. And then goes out and, you know, pops 15, 15 goals. He racks up another 69 assists, shoots the puck 200 times and blocks 100 shots. And, you know, here I am eating my words. Yeah, right now he ranges around 150 shots. He only improved four shots from last season. Um, Which is not about 150 shots for a defenseman. I just think that like the amount of ice time that he commands... Mm -hmm. Like he could, you know, I'm, I'm not expecting like the old Brent Burns numbers where you're talking 300 shots from a guy who plays on the back end. But, you know, there are lots of defensemen who are in the 200 and plus shot range and who can pick up goals and still rack up assists and everything. And yeah, he's just, right around 25, 23 to 25 minutes on the ice. So he should be, you know, shooting a lot more. I expect especially that number to go up. Defense. I expect it to go up. Like that's how you see defensemen who also play a little bit of the penalty kill. Like they start to top mm -hmm. those those really elite numbers of time on ice. You know, you're pushing the 26, 27 minutes a night. Uh, he can get there, maybe under you know the pocket regime. But man, I'm 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 having a hard in that range when I'm looking at guys like Haskin, even guys like behind him, like Roman Yossi, who is yes, he's getting older, but I mean he is the example. You talk about a defenseman on a possibly bad team that's going to do everything i mean <laughs> you know roman's right there you know it, roman's right there you know we expect to step back from the bruins and charlie mcavoy is the clear number one there so i mean that in a similar vein but you know i know you're not a big fan of mcavoy uh carlson i think because he's got Latang there that just eats into like whatever like they're going to try and split that workload a, a workload up a bit yeah dougie hamilton at plus 2500 if the devil's offensive juggernaut that we expect them to be really takes off and he's going to be a big part of that, both on the power play and, you know, getting heavy minutes, it's not crazy for them, for Dougie Hamilton to maybe emerge on that side as well. So, I mean, once you get below him, you know, I think uh, Moritz Sider is a similar uh, description to Miro Haskin in terms of being an all around defenseman. I don't think he's Calder. I don't think he's Norris worthy yet just because Detroit's not really there yet, but as they get better, he will move up that board as well. What about so, Morrissey in uh, Vancouver? Uh, not Vancouver, in um, Winnipeg? Winnipeg. Uh -oh. <sighs> I don't like Winnipeg. Very good defenseman, but I don't know if he's going to be in the running. I don't think that... I, 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 to the la lack of a better term, I don't think there's enough sex appeal there with a Josh Morrissey versus... Uh, you know, like even like a Roman Yossi or if the Predators stink, you, do, you know that he's doing everything and that's going to be visible. I don't know if Morrissey, it's the same kind of deal with Morrissey. Great real life player. Correct. Great, like great player. I would obviously I'd have no problem him being on my team. I just think the Jets are not going to be very fun. They're not going to be a very fun hockey team. And I don't think it's like, I, I just don't think they're going to like, he's going to, he still needs somebody around him to help. And he was, look, he was very good last year. Like he, he legitimately broke out, right? Like he's got 76 points. You know, he, he put the puck in the back of the net and everything. And he was very, very good. Um, I, I might expect him to come back down to earth just a little bit here. I mean, his previous total uh, high was 37. So, you know, is like, is Josh Morrissey like, like really good now? Like, is he like, as he hit his prime ish and he's going to take off or did he just, have a really one good year. Uh, I don't know if I'm ready to to bank on him yet. I I, I agree. I mean, he listen, like you said, in terms of NHL defenseman, he's up there. You know, with, but you know, for the cat, what you need to get voted for the Norris, I don't think he's going to have that this year. I don't think he'll have that. But he's going to be important there. And don't forget too, with Winnipeg, if depending upon when they deal with Hellebuck, even though we don't like to. You know, there are people that still use plus minus. His plus minus is going to go down once Hellebuck's out if he's out early in the season. So, but m most voters are probably educated enough to not use that as a baseline in their voting. Uh, now we, uh, we're on the blue line. Let's move back over to uh, the crease. And let's talk a little Vezina trophy odds here. And uh, before, uh, you know, I, you know, I, my first question to Chris here is the Devon Levi jersey you're getting in the mail. Is it white, blue, or the old uh, black and red ones? And uh, yeah, when's it going to arrive? 
I want the 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 black one with the saber head on it. So if there's any uh, Buffalo Sabres fans who want to send me one, I will gladly accept it. You can put Levi on the back, and I will gladly wear it. Kid is from Kid is from Montreal, so there's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's that's how I can get away with it, uh, with being okay with it. To me, I just feel like if he wins the Rookie of the Year, then he's obviously cleaning the Vezina with it. Like these two go together hand in hand. So. If 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 he wins one, it's because he was so good that he could win the other one and he could beat out the other goalies that are here because of his age, because of the team that he plays on. Like, I expect Ilya Sorokin to be good. I expect Igor Shosturkin to be good. I also expect Jake Ottinger to be good. I'll throw Connor Hellebuck in there. It doesn't matter where he plays almost. Like, I expect these guys to be good. I, I, I don't think many people expect Devin Levi to be this good. So if he does enough, if, if he does enough to win rookie of the year, he he has to come and collect his Vezina. I don't like, I, I have a hard time. It's like when goalies win the heart and the Vezina. Like, of, of course, if you win one, you know, the heart, you're, you're going to clean up the Vezina as well. Uh, you know, shout out to Carey Price, who's the last goalie to do it. I was going to say, yeah. before. And his predecessor before that was Jose Theodore. So, you know, these these things like this are, are to me, I think there's an opportunity there for him to win it. Now, the question is, is, you know, are fans going to care enough about Buffalo to to look past the names of these kids, uh, of these guys and say, OK, yeah, we'll give it to them because because I've, I've already given it, by the way, plus five plus five thousand. So. <laughs> I will gladly take that. Like I am like, I'm not even sipping the Kool-Aid. Like I got a full manufacturer manufacturing plan and we are producing the Devin Levi uh, Kool-Aid at an industrial level. And we are handing it out. It's basically uh lemonade right now <laughs> at the, on the side of a beach. Like that's what it is. And I mean, look at the, like he's in conversation with like John Gibson is plus 5,000 and, and John Gibson's on the, probably the worst hockey team that's there. Uh, Karova Mako as well. Uh, I can't believe Darcy Kemper is even on this list. That's kind of, it's kind of wild. Uh, you know, the, Philip Grubauer, like he, he's completely forgotten because he's a rookie and that's what the market expects. They expect him to not do well, but I'm not there yet. I, I find it funny can. that Tristan Jarry's at plus 5,000 for a team that's expect. I mean, like, yeah. He, he's got the same odds as the t- a goalie that's expected to play for one of the three worst teams in the league this year. But I mean, I, I, how Grubauer is plus five thousand over him? I mean, I, that I don't know. But hey, you know, I, I mean, it, so listen, I've you, you know you, that's for me the, the rookie of the year in the Vezina. He's got a they got to win the division. They got he's got to have a year. Like you said, like the, the Kyrie Price here, like the Jose, Th- he's got to have something in that class to pull it off. So for me, it's not chalk, but it may as well be chalk. And it's a little bit of a homer pick, but I got to go with Shesterkin here. Um, Is it really a homer pick, though? I mean, we're talking about Igor Shesterkin here. Even I like I mean, even I would be sprinkling some some money on that. Here's the thing it, it, uh, for the Rangers to get back to a level where we think that they're more than just a playoff team and somebody, a team that can actually make a run to you know, and, and this is not pinning last year on him. They weren't playing defense in front of him. You could take a lot, you, you know, there's a lot of good goalies where if you stop playing defense in front of them, they're going to start letting in a lot more goals. It's just how it works. But, and not to get into whole patterns of stuff, but if you look at, you know, 2019, 20, you know, in that 12 game sample size, 930 save percentage, 2020, 21, 916 save percentage. Then he had his Vezina winning year, 935 save percentage. And then last year was a 916 save percentage. Now you can look at goals against, but to me, that's more of a team stat than a goalie stat. If you follow that pattern, that means he's due for over a 930 save percentage this year. And we all know he's going to have a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. I think at plus 600, you know, you can make listen, I understand Sorokin is the best goalie in the league. You know, you can make that argument uh, a couple of different ways. I would say it's Sorokin. Islanders just aren't going to win enough. So for Sorokin to really have that chance, he's either got to carry the Islanders into the playoffs or he has to do something like Linus Omark did last year to really get to get the consideration, even though he is the favorite. So 
to me, Shesterkin is probably, because of that reasoning, the number two guy is the guy I would go with. That happens to be Shest- Igor Shesterkin at plus 600. That's my pick for the Vezina. Also, you're not going to want to see as much as Jonathan Quick in net. Correct. So he's going to be playing a lot more than he would when Halak was uh, his uh, backup. So, you know, Shesterkin is going to a lot of playing hurt. time. I think that might hurt him more than anything. He's going to be on the ice a ton. Uh, you know, professional athletes now are delicate little flowers, right? They work really hard to become the players that they are. Um, but you know, we know how important it is to rest, uh, bodies. We know what happens to goalies and their lower bodies and their hip flexors and their knee ligaments and everything. And I just think because the Rangers don't really have anybody behind Igor, that he's going to be out there quite a bit as good as he will be. Um, maybe those numbers suffer a little bit. I think ideally you'd want him to play about 55 games. That would sit where he needs to be. Uh, I have a feeling he's going to play over that. He's probably going to play 60. Yeah, he's he's probably like, it would not shock me if he plays like 62, 65 games just because you do not want to give uh, Jonathan Quick as many minutes as humanly possible. It's like every time Quick takes the ice, just assume it's an L. Uh, and and then you'll be fine. And if he gives you a win or a tie, you say, okay, well, we got there. Um, but that was my hesitation for Igor. Jonathan Quick should see the ice on back-to-backs and, you know, on the occasional Arizona, Chicago, Columbus game. In a perfect world, trying to be both conscious of how much Igor should play versus trying to keep his workload somewhat respectable and fresh for the playoffs. It's 60 to 65 games, I think, is that number for Shesterkin. I think once you get north to 65, you start, you're playing way too much, I think, in this day and age. He's going to have to play more. Now, listen, maybe Benoit Allaire has got something up his sleeve. He sees a little hitch in Quick's game or has something that he can fix and say, hey, I can get another year or two out of this guy. You know, Quick is going to be motivated. Hey, he doesn't want his career to go out as being a guy who wasn't even dressed for a Vegas Golden Knights uh, revolving door crease. And he's a Connecticut native, grew up a Ranger fan. There are elements there to maybe think that we can get one serviceable year, 12 to 15 starts out of him. But we'll see. I, I'm hoping that it's not more than that. And I, I, I just hope we're having a debate of Shesterkin versus somebody else for Vezina that me, because that means he had a really good season and he stayed healthy the whole season. So that's all I'm really hoping for is just a legitimate debate for him to be the winner. You know, you also got to look at the defense in front of him. Uh, Miller and Fox, I think that's a top line defense. I don't know how you feel about uh, Lindgren with Truba. Um, and then the uh, Gustafsson uh, Schneider line. I don't like, I don't know how you feel about the third line pairing there. I mean, we'll see. You know, the bottom pairing at this point, you know, we'll, they, they get what they get out of Gustafsson and Schneider. They're going to play their limited, they're going to get, they'll get their opportunities, but they're going to be rolling those top four a lot. Um, uh, you know, Fox and Lindgren, I thought was a good pairing last year. Miller, Truba, but maybe they're trying, you know, maybe they're going to do something else. Let's see how that works out. I just want them to be able to set. I, I like, I'm not a guy who likes to put lines in a blender for the sake of putting them in a blender or a pairing, unless like you're on like a 10 game losing streak and things are going wrong. For me, a defensive pairing, the guy, once you figure out what the defensive pairings are in October, November, I want those to be the uh, health obviously being factored in. Those should be the same pairings in March. Like that that's how defenses build chemistry. That's how like so we'll see how it goes there. But again, you know, I think there'll be a little bit more of a concert a conscious effort to play a play a little harder in their back end. Um, I don't think the Rangers will necessarily become a defensive team, but I you know, it can't be much worse back there, so it should be better this year. Now, Ant, you got a pick here that uh, may be a little bit of a wishful thinking pick for you. Even though it's voted on by the regular season, you're hoping to see this guy maybe. Yeah, I'm going to go with uh, Connor Hellebuck here. I know I know, Winnipeg is on the way down, but it's not going to be his fault. That's for sure. Um, I th- The wishful thinking comes with the fact that he's on a contract year. Uh, he's going to probably play his best to get that money. And eventually he's going to probably be traded to a really good team that's in the playoff hunt. So we're going to really see what he's made of. And I, I think at plus 700, um, I think that that's a good pick for me to go with. And Hellebuck, he won 37 games uh, last season, helped Winnipeg barely get into the playoffs. And then they just got, you know, steamrolled. 
from there on out. But I, I think Hellebuck has a really good opportunity to win it this uh, season. I can absolutely see that because if he plays as well as he did for Winnipeg last year, he'll have the performance there. Then he gets traded, hopefully, by the deadline. He goes somewhere, wherever he gets traded to, if he continues to play top-notch hockey and starts racking up those wins, all of a sudden it, bec- it becomes a darling, and that's what they want to vote for, especially if you don't have like a standout Sorokin, Shesterkin, you know, one of those two that are absolutely just running away with it. Now it kind of opens the door a little. And we're talking about a goalie that could command top flight money be the highest paid goalie in the sport so i mean it 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 would only help connor to to win that you know to win the vesna name that i want to mention here that i'm surprised none of us took was uh jake attinger plus 1200 is that a case because it's going to be very much a team effort in dallas and maybe he gets lost in that shuffle a little bit i mean if we're talking about, a, you know, a Vezina winner has got to be somebody that's, you know, on a good team that has an impact and all that stuff. He, he checks all those boxes if it's not one of the New York goalies. I don't think it was anything. It's nothing personal to him. I think he can do very well and, you know, succeed. It would shock me if he's a one of the three finalists. I think for me, it's more of, you know, Dallas in general as a team, you know, yes, they have some young players in that lineup, but uh, they also have the Joe Pavelskis who are getting a little bit older, the, you know, the Jamie Benz, the Tyler Sagans, uh, right? As good as Miro Haskin it is, I mean, that other, the rest of that blue line is kind of mid. So I don't know what, like, th- th- there's an opportunity for them to do well. I think the West, uh, specifically their division, like, it's, it's, it's okay. So I think that they'll be good. And Dallas makes the playoffs, but like I don't know if it's going to be because of Jake Ottinger. I think he just has to be a good goalie, and Dallas will make the playoffs. And then what happens when you get there is whatever happens when he gets there. But I'm not looking at him going, oh, like is it great value at 1200? Not really. I don't think it's great. Like I would, I, I at, at that range, I'd go with Philip Gustafson. If I wanted something in the middle, I think yeah, Liv uh, I, said, right? better team. I, I, th- I think I'm right there with Chris. Uh, it's yeah. not the talent of Jake; it's the value. I think honestly, I, maybe I'm reaching. I rather take the 2500 on Georgiev in Colorado, and also the what was it the plus five thousand on Tristan Jerry? I know that that's a reach, but I think I might take that as well over the 1200 for uh, Jake. Fair enough, certainly, and I, I agree because it's a. Uh... They're a product of everything versus him maybe having to carrying them through. So, yeah, that definitely, you know, factors in as well. So we've talked rookies. We've talked defensemen. We've talked goaltenders. It's time to move up to the forwards now. And uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is the Rocket Richard. And this one's easy, folks. Who do you think is going to lead the league in scoring? Uh, Connor McDavid at plus 220. Uh, He was the league leader last year with 64 goals. Uh, Then you got Austin Matthews, Leon Dreisaitl, David Pasternak, Miko Rantanen, and uh, Kirill the Throw Kaprizov. And Jason Robertson, that's probably where you, you, you're to upper tier of, you know, if, if it's McDavid, then everybody else. And then, you know, Thompson could certainly jump into that class. We'll see. But he's got a couple of shooters on his line. So uh, he might be more of a point total guy, an Art Ross guy. Um, Jack Hughes certainly could have a ton of points this year in that Jersey top six. Same for uh, McKinnon and, uh, and uh, Kachuk. And hey, Alex Ovechkin, a plus 2,500 for the Rocket Richard. You know, the. For a guy that they're going to just keep feeding the puck, you know, certainly not a bad way to go. So let's uh, let's uh, start with you, Ant. You uh, like uh, you, you're going chalk here. You're going McDavid, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that because all that that guy does scores goals. Yeah, every year gets better and better. Uh, Twenty more goals than he had the year before. I was thinking about Austin Matthews as well because I don't know if if there may be dry sidle taking some goals away from McDavid, but it's, it's Connor McDavid that we're talking about here. So you have to, I have to, like, I, I, I could not, but you know, Austin Matthews at plus plus five fifty isn't bad. You know, he just signed the, the contract. Uh, he'll be running the ship there in Toronto and my heart of hearts, a little plus 1600 on Jack Hughes is uh, looking kind of nice to uh, sprinkle some, some dough on. 
Uh, it's tough to listen again. It's tough to not go with McDavid. I mean, it, it, that's one of those times where betting on chalk is probably going to get you some money. I mean, it, even with Drysaddle there, he still leads the league at scoring. He just gets better and better every year. Like what? Like he? It, it's like, is there a floor? No, there is no floor for Connor McDavid. It just continues to score more, get more points. Uh, I don't know what, what much more you can do. All he needs is a Stanley Cup, and then we're we're good. I mean, you know. If, if his flu, you, you talk about 50 goal scorers, that's probably McDavid's floor right now in his career is 50 goals, which is crazy to say, but that would be his bottom short of an injury. Of course, that's literally to me. I think the only way he does it when it was like, he breaks his wrist on something he shouldn't have. And then he's out for like two, three months and, and then he doesn't get it. Um, I went with uh, Jason Robertson for all the things I said about Dallas uh, Jason Robertson can score goals. He he is a little bit streaky at times, so sometimes he just pops. You know, he, I feel like he's the net is like a, a like a goal in soccer, right? It's so big for him, he can just funnel it in. And then there are times where he gets real cold, uh, and it's tough. But the one thing that doesn't waver for him is that he is a shooting machine. Like he loves to shoot the puck. Um, and Dallas doesn't have a ton of guys who can shoot the puck like as he does. Uh, we know that Joe Pavelski is the tip expert. Uh, we know he can do that. I'm not like, I'm looking at the rest of this Dallas team, right? And I mean, I'm not looking at Jamie Ben to repeat what he did. I know Matt Duchesne comes in, but he's a little bit older. Uh, Evgeny Dodonov is still in the NHL. So that's kind of, uh, so that's kind of what's going on here. I think he is the pure, the pure goal scorer. And he's playing with the best centerman in my, in my opinion on that team in Rupe Hints. Uh, so those two can just kind of hang out, go have fun. Uh, Hints can kind of give Robertson the puck and he can set up and he can fire it in, in, into the net. He plays the off wing as well uh, on, on the power play on the right side because I believe he's a left-handed shot. So to me, it's he can get there. And there's some players in front of him, right, that can do some damage. I think, you know, Mikko Rantanen is one of them and Kirill Kaprasov. I think the only thing holding Kirill back is the skill around him. I don't think he has that elite player um, to help him out, right? I'm not taking anything away from Matt Zuccarello, but he's not elite. Um, neither is Joel Erickson Eck. Uh, David Pasternak's going to come back down to earth because he's going to realize that Pavel Zaka is not Patrice Bergeron. Um, and I don't know what I'm getting out of Austin Matthews. I know he scored 60, and then last year didn't, didn't really kind of work out. I know he was dealing with a wrist injury. I don't know. Like, I feel like the Toronto Maple Leafs are going to be a better structured team and there are more players on that team who can help score goals. Toronto is already one of the better teams in the league in scoring. And I feel like what they're trying to do now is kind of spread that scoring out through three lines. So I don't like he's going to get his goals and he's going to score. And I think he can score uh 45, 50 without breaking a sweat. Uh, but I think we could see Jason Robertson hit that level that Miko Rantanen hit last year uh, playing with, Right, McKinnon, which is the 60 plus goals. It's going to take over 60 goals to win this award because I'm assuming uh, Connor McDavid is just going to get 60 because he decided this, I don't know, two weeks before the season starts. Like right now, he's sitting at home. He's like, ah, I'm going to score 70, you know, like something of that just because he can, because that's how great he is. He decided he wanted to score more goals and he did it. Yeah, he's kind of that, um, you know, if he decides I'm going to wake up and score a goal today, like it's going to happen. You don't try and stop it. Just, you know, let it happen and get it over with quickly. You know, the man is dedicated to a, a whole other level of greatness. And I, just, I mean, I don't, I don't know, man. <laughs> it's like everything he wants to do and he just does it. Not even like second best. He's just the best at it. He's like, Hey, I'm going to shoot at, I'm going to hit all four targets in the all-star game because I decided that's what I wanted to do. Cause I knew I was going to win the fastest skater. So I just want to dominate something else just for fun. Now, speaking of McDavid, uh, yeah, it is fantasy draft season, folks. So just a friendly reminder that no matter what the league format, if you have Connor McDavid, for if you have the first overall pick, take Connor McDavid within the first 10 seconds of the draft starting. Like, don't, don't be that guy that milks. Like, this is not other sports where like, oh, am I going to go running back? Or, you know, just, it's Connor McDavid. That There's is the first one. overall pick. Just if you do don't take him, please send us all a message. I want a full essay with thesis as to why you didn't. Uh, so we can just put an F on it immediately. I don't think I'll get past the third line because there's there's no explanation for it. Now, speaking of a consensus number one ranking, if you head over to fantasyalarm.com right now, you can get uh, the uh, fantasy NHL draft guide that uh, 
one of these uh, lovely gentlemen below me here, Mr. Christopher Moray, uh, was a part of, along with Andrew Dewhurst. Uh, they've got all the rankings there. And uh, so I had a draft over the weekend, and I had that open uh, right next to my draft panel for uh, any time I had to make a decision between two guys. You know, I just consult the rankings. So thank you, and Chris. breaking, breaking, Connor McDavid is first on it. I know. Yeah, you're not supposed to say those things. You want to get the people to sign up for the subscription. You know? I want to get them hooked in with that one. That's the one, you know. Hey, there you go. So, uh, yeah, so that is, you had mentioned uh, Miko Ranton in the season he had last year of Robertson getting to that level this year. That's who I got. Um, and I know, you know, Landis Cog is going to be back in the mix this year. But Ranton had 55 last year. I don't think that Pasternak is going to get over 60 again. So that's one competitor out of his way. And again, we're, we're, we're saying this assuming that McDavid misses some time because that's really the only way the door is left open. If the door is left open, and yes, you could say, well, if McDavid's not there, that should make Dreisaitl's number go up. And yes, that's another way you could go with it. I just think uh, with that Colorado top six, they're going to be relying heavily on McKinnon and Ranton in. Um, you know, it looks like Drew Ann is going to be the left wing on that line. Um, it could be our Turi Lekkinen. We'll see, you know, how they, that shakes out. Um, maybe they go Landis Cog. Who the heck knows? But nonetheless, I like Rantanen. And just as a sidebar there, I know we're going to get to props later, but his uh, goal total is at 44 and a half, and it's minus 115. Give me the over on that all day. We'll talk a little player props later, though. But uh, uh, what are your thoughts on Rantanen in Colorado? He gets two passers. He gets McKinnon and Drouin if he sticks on that line to pass him the puck. Oh, my God. I think he can better his total. I think he can better at 55. Like, the one thing I learned from watching Jonathan Drouin play in Montreal is that the man could be on a breakaway and he would still try to pass it. Uh, so he is a pass-first mentality player at all given times. Uh, good news is he's going to a team that has players who can finish those passes. So Drouin might finish with, like, seven goals. Uh, but like 50 assists, and that wouldn't shock me one bit. So I like the advantage that Drouin brings to, you know, Rantanen at that point. Ryan Johansson is in the exact same boat. I don't think he knows how to shoot the puck either. Uh, so Colorado's got a good mix of guys who can shoot the puck and a good mix of players who just facilitate it around the ice. Uh, Terry Lekkinen goes to the net. Love the man. Valerie Natushkin is apparently still part of the Colorado Avalanche and he can shoot as well. So Colorado's power play should be fine, I guess. I'm I love it. I love Mika Ran and to go out there. I don't think he gets the credit that he deserves. I think he is uh what Leon Dreisidel is to Connor McDavid. Like Miko Ratnan is elite, and I think he gets lost because he plays behind Nathan McKinnon. Uh, did, but like Miko Ratnan is an elite shooter in the NHL and he's very good at what he does and he just doesn't get the, the love. Every time I play DFS, somebody's like, Oh, I'll, I'll take McKinnon. And then I'm like, Okay, but what, like, what, like, why are you not stacking him with Ratnan? And the, like, he's always the guy who's forgotten. And I feel for him a little bit because like the man's good. He's a guy that falls in drafts where if I'm towards the end of that first round and he's still there, you know, in that eight after window. Unless, you know, it's him or Brady could chuck at that point for me. And depend, if it's not a banger league, then I'm taking Ranton for sure. So, you know, I, I like all of our picks here. I think, you know, McDavid is, the, the, you know, the way to go. And then, you know, Robertson or Ranton and certainly a couple of nice alternates there. And, uh, and you know, we've talked to Alex Ovechkin in the past, plus 2,500. Uh, just to look at now, listen, he, he's led the league in scoring uh, one, two, three, four, five, it's nine times. Um Last time was in 2019-20 with 48 goals. He had 52 years ago, 42 last season. If Washington finds them, if they find themselves in a situation where they're realistically not going to be the, in the playoffs, you know, down the stretch, Ovechkin's going to get still get heavy minutes every night, and they're just going to keep feeding him the puck. So if he is within striking distance. I mean, I, I, yes, I know he's older, so does he have it in him to break 50 again is the question. If it's going to happen, it's going to be this year. It's not going to be next year. It's not going to be the year after that. So this is probably the last year that we can really see OV maybe break that 50 barrier and really have a chance at a Rocket Richard. Yeah, they're he's really gonna... going to try to you know get him the puck as much as possible, try to get him to break that record as quickly as possible. So... Uh, I mean, the plus twenty five hundred. You know, I I would take on a veteran. I just I I don't think that 
I, I don't think that he scores more than McDavid, but he might get over to the 50 goals. Uh, and like you said, it's going to be this year, if anything. Two minutes on the power play. Let him set up in his office and just let him clap. I don't I don't know. Like, it's not hard. And his, his shot's not getting worse. He was never, like, his foot speed was good. But the one thing that sets Ovechkin apart from his counterparts is, like, that's a big boy. And he can fly down the ice with some of the best. Maybe his step is not what it was, but he's still getting down the ice. And he's still, like, he can still bang people around. Like, he's he's still fine. As long as his health keeps up, he missed a couple of games last year, but he still played 73. He's, he's, he's played over, like, 70 games most of his career anyways. He has been very, very durable despite the way that he plays. So I don't think it's... I don't think it's out of the question to score 50. Uh, I think it might be like, again, it's, it's tougher, but uh, I think it's a question of how healthy Nick Backstrom is. I think that plays a part in it as well. He needs somebody to facilitate him the puck and that's fine. Uh, same thing with him getting Kuznetsov. So, I mean, I'm not, I don't know, like the odds would have to be pretty high over 50 goals for me to take it just because I think it might be a little bit more difficult for him now that he is slowly aging uh, and Father Time always wins that battle. He's 38, though, and he's still doing what he does, which is incredible. What I would like to see, and I'm surprised nobody's done this yet, Like, and, and who knows now with the digital boards and stuff like that, but and plus the amount of money you get for board advertisement, I don't know if they would give this up. They should like draw like up near the sideboards like have like Alexander Ovechkin's office, like have like a little desk with like a picture of his kids and like make it look like an office over there for his last game. They absolutely need to do something like that on all four, like half walls on each side of the rink. I think that would be great. Um, now he has won the heart trophy three times. It's now time for us to get to the heart trophy discussion. And uh, Oh, what a surprise. Connor McDavid at minus one Oh five. Um, that's how f- much of a favorite he is. He's not even plus odds to win the heart. He is at minus 105. Uh, other names on that list, Nathan McKinnon at plus 900, Leon Dreisaitl at plus 1,000, Matthew Kachuk at plus 1,200, and then Austin Matthews at plus 1,600. Can't see Kaprizov really in the mix there. Hughes certainly at plus 1,800 is not a bad way to go either. But for me, as I look at this right here, I'm going with Matthew Kachuk. Last year was, you know, he was really put out there. You know, it was not to say his coming out party, but he started to become as much of a household name as a hockey player is going to become in the United States. He's the guy that they push. He's going to be promoted a lot. Florida's a good team. 104 points last year, 109 points this year. As long as Florida does, as long as Florida's competitive, makes the playoffs, and Kachuk is still very much the straw that stirs the drink and goes his, and makes a name for himself. Just c- keep doing what he's doing. I think he could maybe steal the heart trophy if he really just has a top notch season. That's fair. I, I, I went with the chalk here. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to bet against McDavid too many times here. <laughs> I didn't take him to, to win the, you know, the scoring titles. So I figured I got to get a piece of him somewhere. I'll take it where I know he's going to get it. He is exactly 150 points away. Uh, from a thousand in his career, uh, by that time he'll probably be 27. Uh, so he'll be 27 years old with a uh, thousand points to his name. Uh, I know he doesn't like he wants to downplay that milestones are not important and all this and all that jazz. But I mean, the type of competitor that he is, I I I know that he knows and that he wants to get there and that he wants to do it. Uh, I don't even think 153 is like his height that he can get to. I think he can get to 100. And 60. I, I think he can be the first player to flirt as close as possible with a two point per game average. Like one point is a lot, right? In in the modern NHL. I think he can be the the guy who flirts with close to two points a game. Now he does McDavid doesn't have a counterpart the way like Crosby and Ovechkin do. Ovechkin's a three time heart winner we just mentioned, and McDavid's a three time heart winner. And uh, McDavid's quite a bit younger than Ovechkin. So it, it's just crazy to think that. And that it's not even like he's starting to slow down. It's just, you know, how many hearts is he going to get? Like, is he going to have, he's going to have, if he, he got a ring for each one, he's definitely going on to a second hand at some point. I just, I, I truly believe that he can hit 100 and, you know, 60 plus points. I, I don't believe that that to be. Looking at Edmonton, looking at the, the division that they play in to start with, there's some teams in there that are, you know, let's say Vancouver doesn't really progress and let's say Calgary is still, you know, not who they are. I mean, he gets to beat up on San Jose 
in Anaheim uh, as much as possible. Every once in a while, he'll cross over to the Central uh, and beat up on Arizona and, you know, Jordan Bennington, Chicago. Yeah, then he'll come east a couple of times. He'll get, you know, the the Philadelphia Flyers, the Columbus Blue Jackets. Uh, I can say this. The only team he doesn't have a ton of success against is Montreal, so maybe he'll skip that road trip and say it's not worth it. Uh, but everybody else, he's he, like, he is, he is a force to be reckoned with. So like, imagine if he gets another, I don't know, let's say he betters 153. Like he can't take his heart away. Like it's, you know, he just can't do it. Imagine bettering the totals that got you the one trophy in the first place. So I'll take the, like, honestly, 105. That's still, that's as close as you can get to it. Right. Like I thought that number would be minus 115, minus 120, just considering how good he is. 105, I'm like, all right, it's almost even money. I'll do it. You want to know how I know Santa Claus is a hockey fan? Because Bedard versus McDavid is on December 12th, the first one, and then January 9th. So right before he gets real busy prepping for all of his deliveries, and then just right after he gets home and is settled in and has done all of his inventorying, and he can finally put a feet up, he's going to get both. Listen, it's not a coincidence. Somebody getting... Are they on ESPN too? Like, are, are are they on the big channel as well? Like, Chicago's got a whole bunch of games on the big channel for no reason. But oh yeah, by the way, I, Connor versus Connor is probably a selling point. I, I would imagine. I don't have the TV schedule up in front of me, but I would imagine yes, at least one of those is going to. Let's see. So one's uh, doesn't. Even I'm assuming game. Disney would want that to be up there, right? That, the, the marketing would kind of make sense. Connor versus Connor. That'd be kind of fun to watch. So December 12th is a Tuesday for sure. That'll be a TNT game in the states, and then let's go to January 9th. That is also a Tuesday big surprise. So yeah, that's going to be a. I'm Santa, Claus, I, Santa Claus takes Tuesdays off. That's what probably. I understood from this. The shop is closed on a Tuesday. If you take nothing else away from this week's better hockey, now just take all that away. That we we, we we've cracked Santa's holiday schedule and yeah. what he likes to do. I also uh, want that game to finish in overtime, three on three. That's all I want to see. I don't care for uh, the rest yeah. of it. I want to see those two. I want to see. I want to see McDavid, Drysaddle. Whoever plays you, you know what? Put another forward out there just for the fun of it, because it doesn't matter. And then I want to see Connor Bedard, I guess Seth Jones, and like whoever else is alive in Chicago. And that's it. And then I just want to watch, just don't even let them change. Just McDavid and Bedard up the ice. I was watching Bedard. He did they were questioning. He was like, Oh, you didn't look over the bench to change. He's like, I love to play hockey. And I'm like, Yeah, kid. I do too. Like, stay, stay out there. Do your thing. Just have some fun. That's all I want to watch. I want to watch those two just skate up and down the ice like a track meet and if watch all their teammates just look at them and say, man, I wish I could do that. If we're not, if we're not going to get that kind of ending, then what I want instead is one of these anything you can do, I can do better games where like McDavid has like four goals and three assists and Bedard's got like three and five or something. It's just like something insane. I mean, I know those are high point totals, but oh, you know what I mean. Both those, both those teams have goalies who can help us get to that level. You know, Jack Campbell versus... I don't like whoever for Chicago, those two goalies that night, just, you know, tell them this is one of those games where they're, they're going to have to tough out 60 minutes and it's not going to be pretty. What you're not drafting Pete Morazic or Arvid Soderblom in any of your fantasy drafts. Peter this Marazic, year? You're right. I am not uh, drafting Peter Morazic. Uh, I'm surprised his ligaments for his lower body are still intact at this exact point. So, yeah, so we got another matchup, you know, an Austin Matthews versus Bedard matchup also will be entertaining, you know, uh, when the Blackhawks and the uh, Leafs get together. And you got a you you like Matthews here, huh? Yeah, I like Matthews for the value. Obviously, McDavid is probably the way to go. Uh, I like to check uh, Kachuk, too. Uh, But Austin Matthews at plus sixteen hundred, you know, if this was last year or the year before, he would be right next to Connor McDavid. Uh, at the top of that list, uh, he has one already, winning in 2022. So I'm going to put my money on on Austin Matthews for the value at uh, plus 1,600. Certainly not a bad way to go. He's definitely going to get a lot of points up there in Toronto. And by the way, uh, if McDavid has a season like he has, like that we all expect him to, and it's just another you know one in the books for him, we'll rename this episode next year. If Connor McDavid got hurt, here are our picks. I mean, you know. <laughs> I mean, do do we do? We, I mean, he's not in the Norris or Vezina or Calder, Calder conversation. And I didn't do Jack Adams Trophy because, like, it's really tough to predict who's going to be Coach of the Year before they've coached the game. 
Like you can, so like uh, we left that one out on purpose. Forgot to mention that at the top of the show. So uh, we've we've gone through all the major awards here. We got two more things left we want to do. Uh, we got uh, some point total odds we want to discuss this year, and uh, some player props to close out with. So, uh, without further ado, uh, let's take a look at the uh, point totals here. And uh, so, let's start with you. And uh, who's your? You got one over and one under. Let's hear the over. I'm going with the Devils, of course. Sure. Uh, over 104 and a half points last season they were right around uh 112 just one point behind the hurricanes i expect that to improve with the addition of tofoli and a full season of timo meyer uh, jack hughes taking another step nico Heischer, brad i mean luke hughes in the picture uh dougie hamilton gonna be healthy after his surgery in the off season so i i had to take the over on the devils i wanted to I'm always looking for the value and stuff, but you know what? I'm going to take something that I think is going to, you know, be legit. And I'm going to go with the devils right there uh, over one four and a half. I almost put the devils down as mine, but I wanted to try and be a little bit different than yours. But yeah, the, the, the logic is sound. There's every reason to think that, you know, the only argument I can make against that is that they're expecting the Rangers and the Penguins to be better than they were last year. So maybe that top tightens up a little bit. But in the same breath, if we're expecting the Devils to win that division, they're going to have to clear that anyway. It's not like that point. To, that division winner is not going to be at 105. That division winner is going to be closer to 110. So if we expect the Devils to be there, then they're going to hit that over. And Carolina is going to be just as good, too, if not better. Right. So uh, even if it's they're not close to 113, I still think they're going to break at least uh, 104 and a half. Uh, my under was Chicago, and I know they have Bedard and everything, but under 71 and a half points, I think they were. Let me double check the standings. I can't remember where they were. They were at 59. So uh, I don't see them being, I, I don't know how much better Connor Bedard is going to put them on his back. Obviously, you guys mentioned the goalies, not great. Uh, the, the team around is okay. So, you know, they might not get to 71 and a half. Maybe they're somewhere around in the 60s, but I, I don't see them breaking the 71 and a half, not just yet. Uh, we need a more around Connor Bedard to, to get to that point to make it. So let's do a little math here. So Connor Bedard is the, the reason why they put him at 71 and a half, despite the fact that they finished with 58, you said last year. Going into last year, knowing that the Blackhawks were going to be piss poor they were six they're over under were 66 and a half going into the season so they're five point better expectation with bedard going into the season even though they were about eight points under that so it's i think a 13 point swing uh, i don't know if he's worth uh, listen is he going to score a lot of goals yeah is he going to be fun to watch is he going to be is he going to lead sports center some nights sure is he going to help you win a fantasy hockey league this year maybe probably I, I just don't see Chicago win it. Like, I think Arizona is better than the Blackhawks, to be honest. I, I, think I think they finish ahead of them in that division. So you're talking about a team that's going to finish eighth, seventh, if best case scenario. I just I don't see it there. So I agree. I, with I almost took the the over on Arizona, uh, just because I think that they're uh, I think they're way better than they were uh, last year. There were little spurts and hints of them, you know being a lot better. And I, I think, I think they had a, a bad ending to their season last year. They finished one, seven and two to end, end the year uh, finished with 70 points. Uh, but I, I, I think that they're way better than the Blackhawks and um, the Blackhawks had a lot of work to do before they even get close to the talent that's on the coyotes. I know Bedard is the top talent, but I, I feel like the coyotes have a lot more and, and they brought in, you know, Sean Dursey. Um, they got Cooley going to be in that so uh yeah the blackhawks to me I, like you, you said 66 points from last year i'd rather take that uh as as where the blackhawks will finish so arizona finished and i thought about the 76 and a half too but it, they finished with 70 last year their over under was 64 and a half going in i thought the six point jump even in that division where i'm a little more li uh, likely to see it it's a little it just i i liked it i didn't like it enough I think yep. there was just enough reason to scare me off there as a six point jump because it's like all right I'm banking. There is the side of it that I'm banking on the Coyotes to be a much improved. So, you know, again, they have made improvements. I'm a big JJ Moser guy as a like a last round pick for if you need a defenseman because he's going to be on that top pairing and running that power play. Again, a team that's going to suck, but they're going to score. 
So uh, Moser's a guy I'm looking at there, too. Uh, so that, that's your over and under. Now, Chris is going to go on two sides of a storied rivalry here for his over and under. You, you pick where you want to start. Right. So I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going to start by offending the entire uh, Boston Bruins nation because might as well make them happy. Just I have can't help under. myself. Can't help myself here. Just, you know, ads out here making friends with the Leafs nation. I'm out here, you know, just reminding Bruin fans that this is not going to be it. Uh, I have them under 105. I know they had a 30, 100 and what, 32 point season. Like, cool. Uh, we know that they're coming back down to earth. Just like, like the way gravity works is they're going to come down back to earth. And now without Bergeron on this team, like Brad Marchand is, is still okay. He's, he's coming off, you know, he had double hip surgery, I think a summer ago. So like, he's not getting any younger. Uh, poor David Pasternak now has to deal with Pavel Zaka down the middle. Uh, like Zaka. Pavel Zaka, I know. Uh, like this, this team is not like I, you already know how I feel about Charlie McAvoy. I think Linus Olmark, Jeremy Swayman are going to be fine, but they're going to be a victim of the team. They're just going to be a victim of the team not being very good. I, they're going to regress. Is this this team was just they were elite in every category, defensively and offensively. I think defensively they're going to be fine, right? But they're they're going to struggle to score some goals some night. So this like. A hundred is a playoff team, and I don't think they're a playoff team. So they must be under it. That means because they can't get a hundred over a hundred points and miss the playoffs. That would be a really strong uh, Atlantic and Metro, and I don't think that's going to happen here. So I'm going to take the under on Boston. Uh, my apologies in advance. I'm taking the over for Montreal because they're at seventy one and a half. They're at the same number as Chicago. The only team worse right now. I think if well, last time I checked was Anaheim, they're the only team with with a lower point total. And I'm saying, okay, like that's fine. Look, Montreal's not a very good team. I get that. And they were really bad last season, but this team suffered like every player on their roster got hurt at some point. So now you have a healthy Cole Caulfield, Sean Monahan. You discovered that Raphael Harvey Panara can score goals. Kirby Dock is still there. Your Slavkovsky is healthy. Brandon Gallagher's hand is not broken. Right. Mm -hmm. Jake Evans is there, however long Joel Armia can last. And then you got all those, you know, defensemen who can just exist. You're telling me all of that coming together is worth three points different because Montreal had, if I'm not mistaken, was 68 points last season. So you're telling me all that together is a three point difference for odds maker? Come on. Like that's a lot of disrespect in one sitting. I get that they're going to be bad. I have. This is not a playoff team, but you're telling me this is a team that's going to finish 29th in the NHL? Oh, so wow. last that's... year they were estimated to be at 72 and a half. That was their over under going into the season last year. So I, you're I, telling me, yeah, and, and they were, and, and they still got to 68. Yeah. And, and everybody was hurt. Like Quebec hospitals are full already, and they had to welcome the entire Montreal Canadiens roster basically <laughs> into the infirmary afterwards. To the point that their like team doctor now is finally taking his retirement, Doctor Mulder, because I mean the man was getting up there in age, but he it probably took a toll on him as well, having to deal with every single guy coming in here and saying, "Hey, this is not even just like I'm hurt, like I need surgery now. This is broken. This is broken. This doesn't work. This hurts." Like so many guys were out for long term injuries that never returned. This was an AHL team on the ice, and they put 68 points together. So you're telling me all this together is worth three measly points? No, like I've already I've already smashed the over on it. You can call it what it wants, but like I I've already smashed the over because there is even if they're terrible, even if they are, this team is probably in the realms of like 82 points, which is still not playoff worthy. It's not, it's, it's not even close. What are you saying they are, but I mean 71 Correct. and a half is low. I agree. I'm over. I, I would hit the over on Montreal for sure at 71 and a half just because of the amount of injuries they dealt with last year. And Martin St. Louis is a good coach. So yeah, he, he's, like, he's great. He gets he's his just, team to play. There's he only so right. much you can do with what you have, right? Like if you cover a, you know, if you cover anything with, with shit, I mean, it's still terrible, right? You can cover chocolate with turd. It's still a turd. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. That's what he had to deal with. There were guys on that lineup. I had never heard of. I had like, I had to look for them. I had a oh. production teacher that used to say you can only polish a turd so much in terms of over-editing and adding effects. Yeah, it's still terrible. Left. You're telling me that Montreal's on the same wavelength as Chicago? No. Come on. Here's, the, here's the other thing about Montreal if you take that over. 
even late in the season, if you're sweating it out a little bit, St. Louis is the kind of coach where those guys are going to play their ass off through game 82. They're not going to go in the tank at game 77, 78. We're like, all right, I'm shot. If you've mathematically got a chance with Montreal at over 71 and a half down the stretch, yeah. you're in it because of St. Louis. There's a lot of young players on that team who still have to develop that still got to do things like they're they're with the, they're This is year probably three of the process, right? This is year three of the struggle. Uh, and by year five, that's where you start to see this team is going to be, you know, where they need to be. I think next year is when they take a better step and they get everything in order. You know, maybe Connor Hellebach wants to come hang out in Montreal. He can have all the Belle Provence that he wants, the Patin that he wants. We'll show him all the great places for smoked meat. You know, there's lots of things he can do downtown. We'll show him the nice little area. He can live in Brossard by the arena, by the training facility. There's lots of great things for Connor Hellebuck. Maybe, maybe I'm just dreaming in color, but this team is getting there. Uh, but 71 and a half is just a disgrace. I don't know who put this together. Cole now, Caulfield has played three seasons and only 123 games. He only played in 46 games last year. Uh, in 2021, 2022, he had... 23 goals in 67 games. He had 26 goals in 46 games. He was on a path. And if you get him 100% healthy, he's going to be that that superstar yeah. uh, in Montreal. Like they shut him down to say, hey, get the surgery. This team is going nowhere. Get it fixed. He could have finished the year. So you got it fixed towards the end of the year. Now he had the whole summer to recover. So a, a wonky shoulder is now better. It's now, you know, in good structure. It is healthy. So he can go out there and just sling the puck into the net with an even better shoulder. So I I don't know. When I saw this, I thought it was an error. I thought I saw 81. And then I cleaned my glasses and I said, no, that is exactly 71. And then I tried to understand what happened because then I thought Montreal finished with 40 points last year. And then I said, no, they finished with 68. So the math just didn't make sense. So that's that's how we got here. That's That's yeah, why we- I just couldn't believe it. When you finish with 68 points and all those injuries, especially to your top star who was, you know, getting ready to to put a clinic on uh, in the league. Uh, yeah, you got to take the over there for uh, for Montreal, for sure. Not the whole mortgage, but like maybe like like maybe a little bit of a reverse mortgage, you know, kind of thing. Not the whole mortgage. Like don't take out a new one. Just maybe reverse mortgage a little bit. <laughs> so and on your Boston pick now, I agree with everything you said. Step back. No Bergeron, all that stuff. Hundred and, f- and if you think they're going to miss the playoffs, then, yeah, they're not going to hit 100 points. They had 135 points last year. So but we're, we're, we expect the regression. And there is going to be a regression, but a 35 point regression. And I understand we're not talking about going from 100 points to 70 points where you're a wild card team to a miserable team or anything like that. But that is a huge regression. So that's why I'm a little hesitant on that, because even if they drop down to 101, 102, that's still 28, 30 something point. You know, so it's that's why I hesitate on that one. Now, I got a few I'm going to run through quickly here. Um, so let's start with the one over I like, which is the Kings at 105 points. They finished with 95 and a half last year. Uh, they were last year. They were estimated at 95 and a half and they finished with 104. So if you think they're five point uh, four and a half points better than they were last year, there you go. Now, then you look at that division of Vegas, I think one of like 110 or Edmonton in the 109, like they were up in that range. So I think LA is right in that range. And again, they have uh, the Ducks and the Sharks to beat up on, which is my under pick. Now, Anthony went uh, excuse, Anthony went under with the Blackhawks at 71 and a half. I agree. Chris took the approach of 71 and a half is too low. I got to go over on that. As the Sharks are the lowest team at 65 and a half, and I still think that's too high. I, I, yeah. I, they, they had 58 last year, and they were estimated going into the season at 73 and a half. And that was a year that they had Eric Carlson win the Norris Trophy on the blue line and lead the team in scoring. They don't got Carlson this year. So you mean to tell me that they finished with 58 with Carlson through the, not even they didn't have him after the deadline, through the end of the season. You think that they're going to be a 65 and a half point team if you thought they were 70? I, I, I think this is under, I don't even know if they break 60 this year. You know, we talk, you were talking about Montreal before. We're like, okay, they're in year three of the rebuild. As much as they would love to have a top three pick, the, that's not the goal anymore. They're okay with five to ten because now we're in that phase where you're still acquiring young prospects, but like you're not trying to be that bad. San Jose is still trying to be that bad. So 
I, I, you know, I, 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 I they also you, now employ Mike Hoffman, by the way. And as somebody who got to watch him on TV, holy, uh, he is not the same player he once was. Like, give me a reason to say that the Sharks are going to be in that above 65 and a half and close to that 70 point range that we think Montreal is going to shatter, that Chicago is probably going to be just under. Give me a reason. I, I invite you to. I would like to I, give me a reason that I'm going to watch Sharks hockey this year, other than the fact that they're going to be one of the only things on by the time I can actually sit down and watch TV. Maybe You're, there's fun stuff to do around the arena. <laughs> I love that building. It's, it, you know, it's intimate. You know, it's one of the older buildings in the league now, but um, I love going down there. It's about an hour 40 drive for me. I always go when the Rangers come to town and I try and get there one or two other times. You know, it's fun. Even if you just go say hi to SJ Sharky, the mascot, he's cool. There you um, go. Hey, you're our sideline reporter out there in San Jose, so you know all the things that's going on with that team. Uh, I don't even know if they're going to be better than Anaheim. No, they won't be better than Anaheim. Anaheim will be better than them. I think Anaheim is better than them. And, like, not to say significantly better than them, but, like, they're they're probably the two two worst teams in the West this year, or you don't have to throw Chicago and say those three. But I mean, it's San Jose. It's San Jose. The way McDavid's in a tier by himself is tier one. I think San Jose is in a tier by themselves at the bottom, and then you can start doing the Blackhawks and Coyotes and Ducks of the world. The I can't jacket. wait to be sweating a, a DFS slate with San Jose versus Anaheim at ten thirty, watching it on the East Coast. I can't wait for that because. Maybe that game will help cure all the insomnia I've been suffering. I'll, I'll be able to tell the doctor, I said, you know what? I don't need any of that. I'm just going to watch San Jose and Anaheim play, and that should really knock me out. Come on, Logan Couture. I need an assist. Come on. <laughs> uh, two, two other overs I want to throw out there just because why not? Uh, Buffalo at 92 and a half last year, they were estimated at 90. Uh, they were estimated at 78 and a half and got 91. So basically there's, saying that they're only going to be a point and a half better than last year. I think the over is good there. And then Calgary at 94 and a half. Uh, the, oh, last year they were estimated at 103 and a half and they finished with 93, but we all know that uh, th- they were not happy with uh, Sutter there. So I think, you know, just from that standpoint alone, I think they can get to 95. I don't know if they're a playoff team, but I think they can hang around and be in the battle for the wild card down the stretch, which means you got to be in that mid 90 point range. So those are two I like there. Now, we uh, before we get out of here, we got a few player props we want to give out. I'm going to start with mine, and I don't want to uh, step on your toes, but I kind of had to here. This was too good to not take. Uh, Tyler Toffoli over 70 and a half points at plus 100. Um, uh, we talked about the Flames last year and uh, with a curmudgeon head coach, with a guy who was trying to play a defensive system. He had 73 points in that situation. Now he's going to a po- place where... Points are going to be plentiful. Goals, assists. He's going to just be, and he's going to be on the power play on the top power play unit. There's every reason to think that he is going to shatter seventy and a half this year. So, yeah, some people might think, oh, well, he's going to get lost in the mix because you got Meyer, you got Heeshear, you got Hughes, you got all these other guys. Only so many guys can score, but hey, in hockey, you can get two assists on a goal. So, uh, for me, to Foley at seventy and a half, get on that now, and you know, even money, it's a no brainer to me. Yeah, I didn't want to take all the devil's bets because I know it was going to be too much. I'm glad you took one because uh, a lot of people are going to be betting on them this season. I mean, we talked about it already in past episodes. Uh, I took Brady Kachuk over 85 and a half points. He had how many? He had 83 last season, and he's only on his way up. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what what line. Who's he on the line with? Is he on with? Uh, I'm trying to remember. Who's his he, might play a, he might be. He, he, he might play a little bit with line, Josh right? Morris. He was on that top line of Giroux and Stutzel too. Yeah, Giroux and now with Tarasenko in the mix too. So who yeah. knows? Yeah, I, I think uh, the other brother who gets lost uh, in the mix now with uh, Matthew Kachuk being in in Florida and and what he did in the postseason. I think Brady over that. Um, what was it? I said the, the eighty-five and a half. I think that's a, a good goal for him to set. Uh, he was two points behind. I think he could get closer to to ninety. All right, listen, I, 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 as somebody who owns a lot of Brady uh, Kachuk shares in fantasy leagues, he's a guy I love to get when I can get him. I, I got no problem with that right there. I think I, you know, and Otto has improved the offense around the top six this, you know, in the off season last year. You know, bringing in Tarasenko, um, they got Kubalik as well. 
know, Shane Pinto, maybe he even slides up into that top six at some point if he gets a little bit better. So there's a lot of reasons to think that, uh, yeah, Kachuk's going to produce even more this right, year. Right now they have him with Stutzla and Giroux. I mean, you, uh, you, you can't go wrong on that top line nope. to get to that 85 points, 90 points. And, uh, yeah, he's on the top power play, too. So there you go. Uh, Chris, who do we have here for your uh, player prop? Uh, we're going to go with the over on Cole Caulfield's goal total. It's set at 32 and a half. I'm old enough to remember when this opened at 30 and a half uh, on underdogs. It was also at 31 and a half. So I think the market is starting to understand that when you score 26 goals in like 40 some odd games, that puts you on about a 40 plus goal pace for a year. Uh, barring injuries. Again, the Montreal Canadiens are healthy uh, and Cole Caulfield doesn't even need a healthy squad. He just needs Nick Suzuki to just wizardly uh, move the puck around the ice, forehand, backhand, right on the Caulfield stick uh, and he can score. So as long as uh, Nick Suzuki is healthy and Cole Caulfield is on the ice, those two can just go out there and have fun. Uh, Montreal Canadiens power play is abysmal, uh, but it's, you know, Cole Caulfield is going to get the opportunity to shoot the puck. So I don't, I don't understand uh, why Cole Caulfield is this far behind. I, I don't know. Some of his point props are at sitting at 70 points. I think that's a little rich. Uh, just too much for me, just because I think Montreal is a team. Not very good. Uh, but Cole Caulfield scoring goals is like that's something he's going to do. I have him in a ton of drafts. He's on a lot of draft boards that I look at. He's been shooting up a lot of draft boards as well. I think that 32 and a half is low. I think he scores over 40 without breaking a sweat. It'd be cool if he could hit 45, but I think I'm starting to dream in color there. Uh, but between 40 and 45 is where I think he finishes. So the 32, uh, maybe he clears that by like, I don't know, maybe end of January. Maybe he's got 35 by the end of January. And that sounds like, you know, sounds like a good time. Uh, and then I'm going with the over. It's only fair that I finish with Devin Levi because since he's winning rookie of the year, uh, the he's winning and the Vezina, Vezina. Yeah. right? Like he's got to finish with over 23 and a half wins, right? Like I don't, I feel like this number is based on him not being the starter. And I don't understand how that doesn't happen. Like either because the boss, like the Buffalo Sabres, like as a team, right? They're sitting at 92 and a half points as a team, which means that they're flirting with making the playoffs. So is D De is Devin Levi like helping you get there or not? Like, where is this? Like, where is this going? I feel like some markets are are confused. They're like, oh, the like the Sabres as a team are going to be good, but Devin Levi is not going to be good. And I'm like, well, who's going to take over for him? Right? Like, it's not Udo Pekalukadin, so and it's not Eric Comrie. So I don't know how the boss the Buffalo Sabres get to being a playoff contending team without them and Levi like 23 and a half wins is just like like he's gonna win games in overtime as well so I don't know how they got to this number and I feel like it's a little bit disrespectful to him I don't know if it's disrespect or as much as you know maybe the books just being a little behind because you know NHL is not at the top of their priority I mean you know, the Again, call, every, everything you said about Cole Caulfield makes sense. If 26 and 42, then how is he not going to have six more goals and almost double the season length than that? And correct. I saw you. Again, added, don't take out a new mortgage, reverse mortgage a little bit, whatever you have, right? That's that's what we're doing here. And I saw you add Devon Levi as the, as we were about to go to that segment. And my first thought is, yeah, that's that's fitting. That's appropriate. You got to have that. I got. I have a lot of Devin. Again, if you are a Buffalo Sabres fan and you're looking to recruit, right? As a you know, in the closet, I'll wear the jersey. I don't have a problem. I will. I will gladly sport his jersey. Uh, so if you just want to send it my way, that's fine. I'll pick up. Uh, you know, and probably, probably now what? Probably a large for me would fit well. And nice. again, I would like it in black. Uh, with the saber head, that's the one that I I want. Nothing wrong with the other ones that they have, but that's like that's the one that I look at and I'm like, that's cool. I could also wear it uh, to some of my Monday leagues, uh, some of the Thursday leagues. We wear dark jerseys to start with, anyways. Uh, so I could be the forward who wears the Devin Levi jersey. You know, just living living my best life, really. I mean, you, 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 if you're gonna be all in on Levi, I mean, there you go. I mean, you're gonna start wearing Levi's jeans now too, like you know, I, just going all the way through. <laughs> I might go all the way there. That's, you know, they're very comfortable in my jeans. They're, you know, they got lots of different cuts as well. Uh, so I'm excited about that. I'm just excited about things that are Levi this year. So I am heavily invested in him. I feel like I, I feel like I have become the president and CEO of the Devin Levi fan club. Uh, if, you could, 
if you want to have a nice picture for that fan club, I, I'll, you could stay with me. I'm not too far from the 49er Stadium, Levi Stadium. We'll get a picture of you with the Levi jersey standing like in front of it. Levi there Stadium. Go. There you go. I mean, there you go. Perfect. Just let me just let me sleep on your yard outside. Like it's not even cold there. Like, you know, like sometimes we were like, oh, it's cold in the winter. And I'm like, stop it. I live yeah. north of Minnesota in February. Like that's cold. <laughs> it does get down to like like 30s overnight by me. So uh, and I, do have, I have a dog run. So if you want, you know, that's cool. You'll, you'll be protected. You don't have to worry about, no, you know, man, the. I've, I feel like sleeping sleeping outside in San Jose is is different uh, than I would feel like well, I'm, sleeping I'm in outside. Santa Rosa. I'm in the I'm in the North Bay, so I'm about uh, it. I'm, San Jose's weather and my weather are not very different, but they're different. So you know, you're but right. I, I'm not going to offer. You, I didn't even offer you the guest room. I offered you the dog room. That's, that's what fine. you want. That's what you get. So you're like trying to explain to me why the different types of high end champagne are different, and I'm just listening to like that it's high end champagne. That's uh, all. I, that's all I heard. Listen, I'm the same way with wine. Like, I used to think my wife was a wine snob when we lived in New York. And then when we moved to where we are now, I'm like, oh, I get it. Okay. Like, this is what wine's supposed to taste like. Now, I can't break down stuff. I just know what I like and I don't like. That's, All I know um, is I put winter tires on my car in the winter. So that's, not. that's cold. Yeah, I do not. I mean, so I'm yeah, good. I'll sleep forever. Just, just give me a blanket and a sleeping bag. I'm good. My skin is ready. It's leather now. It's, you know, it's so cold here. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we'll, 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 I'll make sure the dog is not out there that night and you'll uh, have it all to yourself. But uh, I can cuddle him. We'll keep me warm. Milo might not enjoy it, but I mean, look, we got to do what we got to do. He's a 75 pound beefy boy, so he would love to cuddle with you. Yes. Um, but uh, so listen, we've we've gone through all the awards. We've gone through some point totals some player props. The previous episode, we went through all the divisional team futures. All the episodes before that, we did many, many mock drafts. Uh, I, th- I think we've gotten you ready for the season here on Better Hockey Now throughout the summer. We launched pretty much right after the Stanley Cup last year, and uh, we've, spent, uh, we've been doing this all off season. Now it's time to do it for real in the season. So uh, we're going to be ba- we're going to be coming out earlier in the week versus later in the week during the season. So stay tuned for that. Next time you're going to hear from us is going to be at the FSGA. Uh, draft, uh, f- a hockey draft. We'll be covering that for you. Uh, we'll have it right for you here on Better Sports Network and Fantasy Alarm. Don't forget to go out and uh, get that uh, all pro subscription, get the seven day free trial, and you can get access to uh, that uh, NHL draft guide there. And uh, listen, it's it's draft season here. We're, we're just over a week away from the start of the season. So get your money's worth. You know, listen, try the free trial for this week. You're not going to, you're not going to go and cancel the second the draft's over because you're going to see how helpful it is. But it's been a really fun off season here on Better Hockey Now on the Better Sports Network and Fantasy Alarm. The next time we uh, talk to you will be uh, the night before season. And then the next time we talk to you after that will be in the season here on Better Hockey Now and on Better Sports Network and Fantasy Alarm. For, for Christopher Merez and Anthony Rivera, I'm Adam Bernard. Talk to you real soon on BHN. Better Hockey Now is on the Better Sports Network.